Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Parshas Pahal It's um, the Parsha ship for this week is going to focus on a Mishnah in Pirkei Ovis. You know that we've been doing a share in Pirkei Ovis. You can check out on my website, www.rabbidunner.com. And just if you, the drop down menu actually has in the library section, has a section on Pirkei Ovis. And every single week we do Pirkei Ovis. In fact, also at Mincha Mariv. So in Pirkei Ovis year I'm doing Perik Aleph. Mincha Mariv I'm doing Perik Vov, which isn't really Mishnah, it's Brisa, but it's not important. Today I'm going to focus on a Mishnah in Pirkei Ovis where we are instructed, Asei Lecha Rav. Do you know what that means? Asei Lecha Rav. It means, find yourself somebody who's going to be your leader, your mentor, the person who's going to instruct you and direct you and guide you and ensure that you stay on the right path. It's extremely important to have good leadership. Now, as an aside, we're now in the midst of a time when there isn't good leadership. We're struggling to find leaders that we can follow. Somebody called me from the UK last week and he said, and I'm not making here, I'm not making this as a political comment. I'm just telling you what the fellow, a friend of mine for many years, said about the upcoming American election. He said, you have a choice of two people that most people wouldn't want to have as their leader. So how is this an election? How is it, how is it realistic? that you're going to elect a leader of the most important and powerful country on the planet who's not suited to the job. It doesn't matter which party he belongs to. He's not suited to the job. Now, I'm, again, I'm not making a political comment, but it is confusing to us that when we have to choose a leader and those who lead us, the choices we have are not necessarily of the highest caliber. What are we to make of that? And what does Judaism have to say about leadership? And I live in the United States. What does the United States, the history of the United States, have to say about leadership? It's extremely important. We need to know what it is that we're looking for in a leader. What are the limits of leadership? And what is the extent of leadership? I say l'chorav. That's really what I want to focus on today. I'm going to read you a few psukim from this week's parsha. Are you ready? Here we go. So the pasuk says, "Vayadabe Hashem el Moshe Leima." God spoke to Moshe and he said as follows: "Kach es halavim, take the Levites mitoch bnei Yisrael from among the Jewish people v'tiharta otam." and purify them, sanctify them in some way. By the way, I have a personal interest here. Do you know why? I am a Levi. So this is absolutely pertinent to me. The es And bring the Levites forward before God and the Israelites should lay their hands on the Levites. Why? They are formally assigned to me, mitoch b'nei Yisrael, from among the Jewish people, tachas pitras korechem b'choir. I have taken them for myself in place of all the firstborn of the womb. Kol m'bnei Yisrael akachti oisom li. Of all the firstborn of the Israelites, I have taken them for me. Kili kol b'choyr b'vnei Yisrael, because the truth is, says God, all the firstborn among the Israelites, whether it is ba'odam of abahema, whether they are man or they are beast, b'yoyim hakoisi kol b'choyr b'eretz Mitzrayim, they are mine from the moment I smote the firstborns in the land of Egypt. Higdashti Oisamli, they were sanctified to me. In other words, God lays claim to the firstborn of the Jewish nation. Any firstborn, whether they are 
a person, a human being, or whether they are animals who are born, they belong to God. And therefore, it should have been them who was chosen from among the Bnei Israel, but it wasn't, it was the Levites. And here's the explanation. Israel. I have taken the Levites in place of all the firstborns of the Jewish nation. And I have formally assigned the Levites to Aaron and to his children from among the Jewish people, to do the work, the service for the Israelites, where in the tent of meeting, in the sanctuary, to somehow atone for the Jewish people, no plague will afflict the Jewish nation, when the Jewish nation, the Jews, come close to the sanctuary. We have here a description and a definition of the hierarchy of leadership of the Jewish people. It should have been the firstborn of every family. For reasons I won't go into now, God changed that plan and God designated the Levite tribe to be the leadership tribe in terms of Judaism, of the Jewish faith, for the Jewish people. There was political leadership. The political leadership ultimately crystallized around the tribe of Judah and particularly the family of King David. But political leadership, and we're going to look at political leadership a little bit later on because leadership is leadership. However you're going to define it and however it's going to be understood, leadership is leadership. When we say Asei L'Chorav, we're not just talking, by the way, about somebody who can be your rabbi, we're talking about somebody who can be your leader in every sense of the word, and sometimes that sense is going to be a faith leadership, sometimes it's going to be political leadership, sometimes it's going to be the leader of the family, somebody's going to ensure that the family is served best in the world, in the choppy waters of the oceans of the world. But whatever it is, you need to have leadership, and there's a hierarchy of leadership. First of all, you have the Bnei Yisrael, who are those who are going to be led. Then you have the Levites. They have been chosen to replace the firstborns. Too complicated to have firstborns leading the world, to lead the Jewish world. Therefore, we've designated a leadership tribe in terms of Jewish faith leadership. It's called the Levite tribe, the Levim, and they if you know anything about what it means to be a Levi, they renounce their rights to any land in Eretz Yisrael. They have their own cities where they live, but essentially their lives are completely devoted to leading the Jewish people. That is what they do. That is their function. But even they are not the ultimate leaders, because ultimately within them there is a family, the family of Aaron the high priest, and he is the leader of the leaders and he is the one who assigns the duties and takes care of the leadership of the leadership tribe. So there's a hierarchy even within the higher echelons of Jewish society. What is the concept of leadership within the Jewish people? How are we to understand it? And this translates itself into all aspects of leadership. Political leadership, rabbinic leadership, ritual leadership. There is an ideal of leadership that is stated within these few psukim, where God instructs Moshe Rabbeinu to create a cadre, a group of people whom, are, whom he invests with the power of leadership over the Jewish people. Not everybody can be a leader, not everybody is entitled to be a leader, not everybody is capable of being a leader. And we give power to those who should be our leaders and we have expectations of those who are our leaders. That is what the Shir today is going to focus on. So I've just given you this as a backdrop to a rather broad topic, the topic of leadership and particularly at a time when we struggle to find leadership 
And by the way, I, I, I'm just going to mention something which is pretty uh, time bound for those of you who are going to be listening to this share on SoundCloud or watching it on YouTube in the months ahead or in the years ahead. This may not be relevant to you then. But at the moment we are reading in the newspapers about uh, uh, defunding or dismantling police in various cities across the United States in the wake of the George Floyd killing, as if somehow taking away the leadership power of the police or the power of the police to take care of us is going to resolve the problem. Why should we have people who lord it over us? They're only going to abuse that power and therefore we would prefer to remove that power from them because life will surely be better if they don't have the power to put their knee on people's necks. That's kind of the logic that one is reading into this particular moment in time. I want to address that from a Jewish perspective. How are we to understand leadership? What are the challenges of leadership and what are the challenges to leadership from those whom are, who are being led? Okay, I think that really sets the backdrop. Let's look at the next piece in the source sheet. By the way, the source sheet is available online, on the website, on SoundCloud and on YouTube. So please, if you want to download it, it's a number of pages. And I'm extremely grateful to Safaria, um, which is an incredible online resource. Uh, because I found much of this material in a particular source sheet on Baaloscha which was prepared and uploaded onto Safaria and I have absolutely shamelessly utilized that Safaria worksheet and I'm delighted to present it to you today. Thank you. So the second source is also in Bamidbar. This is later on in Bamidbar in a parsha about somebody who challenged the leadership. Do you know who, his who he was? His name was Korach. Korach was a relative, a cousin of Moshe Rabbeinu, and he wasn't happy. He wasn't happy that the leadership had been vested in Aaron and in Moses. And even though he was a levy and he had an elevated position within the Jewish nation, he wasn't satisfied with it and somehow he wished to challenge it. He was so upset that he wasn't included in the leadership that he challenged Moshe Rabbeinu and he got together a ragtag bunch of ne'er-do-wells. Not sure that's a word that people watching this share or listening to it use too often, but it's important to know it. Ne'er-do-wells. People who have aspirations way above their station, whose reach is well beyond their grasp, that those were the colleagues of Korach. I want to read you a few psukim from Korach so we get a sense of what the complaints were against Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron HaKohen in the first major serious rebellion against leadership in the Jewish nation. Going back 3,300 plus years. Listen to what the Torah tells us. Vayikach Korach Ben Yitzho, Ben Kos, Ben Levi, Korach, took... I'm not going to go into all the Pirushim on that. I've given Shurim on that in the past. What exactly it was that he took. Vedosna Viram. He was together with uh, a pair of people known as Dosan and Aviram. Bnei Eliov. Ve'oin Ben Peles. And also another fellow called Oin Ben Peles. Bnei Reuven from the tribe of Reuven. These are the ne'er-do-wells who associated themselves with the rebellion of Korach. Vayikalu al Moshe al Aaron. They gathered against Moses and Aaron. Vayomer aleihem, and this is what they said to them: Rav lochem, you have gone too far. Who do you think you are, Moses and Aaron? Why should you lord it over us? Kichol ha'eda kulam kadoshim. The entire nation are holy. Why would you elevate yourselves above them? Over Toicham Hashem, and among them is God. We all stood at the foot of Mount Sinai. Why are you taking charge of us? What gives you the right of leadership over us? That was Korach and Dosan and Aviram and Oim Ben Peles. That is what their rallying cry was. Their protest movement was based on this idea of Rav Lochem, Kichol Ha'eda, 
Kulam Kadoshim. That is what they wanted, their, their message was. It was a message of equal opportunity. It was a message of, you're no better than us, and we are the same as you. And whatever rights you think you have, we have it in equal terms, and we wish to take on the same role that you have, whatever that may be. That was the message of Korach and Dosan and Aviram and Oin. And it continues, Umadua tisnasu ala kahal Hashem. Why would you take charge? Why would you give yourselves this latitude that you are in charge, that you can lord it over us? So what did Moses answer to this challenge? Vayomer Moshe al Korach, Moses said, in response to Korach's challenge, Shimu na b'nei Levi. Very, very clever. Subtle, but clever. He said, listen carefully, B'nai Levi. What is it that you're saying to me? You're saying that I'm privileged and you're not? What are you talking about? You're also privileged. You have privileges that people would die for because you are from B'nai Levi. You have an incredible privilege of belonging to the Levite tribe. You have been chosen by God in Parshas Baloischa. Remember, we just read it a couple of weeks ago. That's what he said to them. You are B'nai Levi. Think about all those people who protest around the world over various issues and topics. And they feel somehow that they have been marginalized or slighted. Think of all the privileges that these people have. If they could only have a sense of their own privilege before they got up and protested against privileges that they feel that they deserve but they don't have. It's just something to think about. Moshe Rabbeinu was simply highlighting the fact that those who protest are very often those who have great privileges. And they're protesting about the fact that they don't have as many privileges as they would like. If you live in a democracy, you're privileged. You have the right to vote. If you live in a democratic society, you're privileged. You have the right, if you're a worker, to belong to a union and to strike. If you live in a Western country, you're incredibly privileged. You have access to credit. You have access to the workforce. You have access to every possible commodity and consumer item the world could ever come up with. You live in a world of great privilege. Just remember that the platform that enables you to protest is a platform of great privilege. Be thankful that you live in a society where protesting won't result in any kind of removal of those privileges. Unbelievable. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu responded to Korach. He said to them, Shimu na b'nei Levi. Remember, people of privilege, you are privileged. Hama'at mikem ki hivdil elokei Yisrael eschem adas Yisrael. Is it not enough for you that the God of Israel has set you apart from the community of Israel? Lahakriv eschem elov. And given you access to him. To, to perform the duties of God's tabernacle, of his temple, and to minister to the community and serve them. You have plenty of privilege. But you're wanting something more. It's not necessarily true that that more that you wish for will be of great benefit to you. As the English expression goes, careful what you wish for. A wish too far. That is something that we always have to bear in mind. We have to know that when we rock the boat, we're not just rocking other people's boats, we're rocking our own boat. Something that we need to think about. And continues the Pasuk. 
Vayakrev oischov es kolachecho b'nei levi itoch uvi kashtem gam kuhuna. He has advanced you and all your fellow Levites. Is it that you seek the priesthood as well? Koirach. Is it not enough that you belong to the Levite family? That you seek something more? Do you need something more? You know the Pirkei Ovis says, another quote from Pirkei Ovis, Yesh mone, rotsa mosayim. Somebody who has 100, he'll always want 200. Uh, uh, now I've got 200. You'll want 400. Uh, now I've got 400, it's enough, no? No, you'll want 800. Human nature is such as that whatever you have, you're always going to want more. Says Moshe Rabbeinu, at least be honest about human nature, Mr. Koyach. At least be honest about human nature in as much that you have something that other people don't and you still want more. The Talmud teaches us that Korach was one of the richest people who ever lived and yet he still wanted more. He still was not satisfied with what he had. It's human nature to the extent that we are able to be objective about the things that we seek in our society and for our lives. Can we be honest about the fact that we're always looking for something more? We want more than we have. Aspirations are fine. Complaints and protests, maybe not. We need to be honest about that. And that's what Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to explain to Korach in his reaction to Korach's demand which began with Rav Lochem ki chol ha'eda kulam kadoshim. And finally the Posuk says, Lochein, and therefore, Ato v'chol adoscha na'odim al Hashem. It is against God that you and all your company have banded together. V'arain mahu ki talinu alav. What exactly has Aaron done wrong? So now we have to look at who it was they were complaining about. Revolution is fine if the revolution is against tyranny. But revolution for the sake of revolution or self-aggrandizement is not fine if there is no tyranny. You know, people pursue their own agendas and people believe that they are better than someone else, but it's not necessarily true if it undermines the fabrics of, of society and the peace that prevails. Aharon HaKoyen was an ish. Oyev Shalom, Veroidev Shalom, says the Mishnah in Pirkei Ovois. He was somebody who loved peace and pursued peace. He was hardly somebody who one could ever accuse of being an underminer of the fabric of society. He wasn't causing any problems. In which case, why are you saying Rav Lochem ki chol ha'eda kulam kadoshim? Why is it as a Levite in Barashas Ba'aloscha you were given special privileges? Why are you trying to remove the leadership status of Aaron HaKohen simply because you would like that role? What's wrong with Aaron? said Moshe Rabbeinu. He's a great guy. Everybody would like to invite him to their barbecue. He's a wonderful person. Why would you want to replace him? Why would you want to get rid of him? He's a marvelous leader. So you see here two things. The first is that the agitation against leadership is sometimes motivated simply because People are not satisfied with their status within society. And it is not necessarily real to assume that just because someone isn't satisfied that their reasoning is sound. It's not necessarily true. Perhaps it's, they're totally fine. They just want something more. They don't need it. It's not important. They still want it. That's number one. Number two, if leadership is good, why interfere with it? They're doing a great job. It's wonderful what they're doing. Why would you suggest that it's so important 
that you need to replace them. If, of course, leadership is poor, if, of course, leadership is oppressive, if, of course, leadership is incompetent, you're, you have every right to complain. By the way, it doesn't mean that you should be the leader. Perhaps we need to rethink the leadership strategy. But if leadership is good, why would you want to replace it or remove its powers or diminish it in some way? That is something that one needs to think about. This is the Jewish approach to leadership coming out here in the first rebellion against Jewish leadership in the history of the Jewish people. And now we have the third source, which is Bamidbar Perik Yud Beis, the 12th chapter of Bamidbar. This is Miriam and Aaron speaking about against Moshe Rabbeinu. They were his sister and his brother. Moshe Rabbeinu was the greatest man. He was the leader of the Jewish people. Listen to what they said about Moshe Rabbeinu. We need to understand what it is that they were concerned with that motivated them to have this negative conversation about their brother. Moshe had apparently taken a wife who was a Kushi. Not clear who she was, whether she was another wife besides the wife he had, or she was the wife that he had, and what exactly Kushis means, it's not important. There was prejudice within the family against his wife. It's not an uncommon occurrence that people don't like their brothers-in-law or sisters-in-law. That's quite a common thing. It's a theme in families. And Miriam and Aharon are human beings, and they had a conversation about their sister-in-law, whether she was a new sister-in-law or the same sister-in-law, and they were concerned about that situation, whatever the situation was. And they said, whatever it is they said, and I've given a share on that in the past, they concluded their discussion with the following observation. They said, has God spoken only through Moses? Is he the only prophet here? Is he the only one who's considered worthy of God's prophecy? Has he not spoken through us as well? By Yishma Hashem and God heard what they said. He listened carefully to their complaint. And based on what he heard, he drew a conclusion. And that conclusion is presented to us in the following psukim. The first thing is an observation about Moshe Rabbeinu himself. He was exceedingly humble, says the Torah. Onav ma'oid mikola odom. Among humanity, his humility exceeded everybody else. Ashel paneah ha'adoma. Vayoyim Hashem. And on that basis, God said, Pitoim, suddenly, al Moshe vel Aharon to Moses and Aaron vel Miriam and to the sister Miriam, to Usha loshta chemel oil moyed vayetsu shloshta. He says, all three of you need to immediately come for a conference in the Oyel Moed, in the tent of meeting. I need to speak to you all right now. He heard the complaint and he assessed Moshe Rabbeinu as being a great honor of a man of enormous humility. And on that basis, he felt that he wanted to meet all three of them and have it out. And he said as follows, Vayered Hashem ba'amud onan, he came down. And he was at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he called to Aaron and Miriam. And Moshe is there. He's watching what's going on. And this is what God says to them. He said, Listen carefully to these words. When a prophet of God arises among you, I make myself known to him. Esvado bachaloim, in a dream, in a vision. Adaber boy, I speak to him. Loichein avdi Moshe bechol beisi nemon hu. Moses is not like that. 
He's not somebody who I appear to in a vision or in a dream. He is somebody who is considered a Neemon Basi. He is trusted throughout my household. He is so elevated in his status. In other words, how could you possibly undermine his status by suggesting that you are on equal terms with him? If there is a great leader, don't imagine that you can supersede that leader, that you can somehow outshine them. There's no one who can outshine Moshe Rabbeinu. That is what God is saying. He may be very humble about it. He may be anything of himself. But this man is an extraordinary man. And you had no right to call him out and to suggest that for whatever reason you were dissatisfied with his lifestyle, that you are on equal terms with him. Per el per adabe boy. I speak to him as it were, mouth to mouth. Umare veloi bechidois utmunas Hashem yabit. I speak to him plainly. I don't give him riddles. And he, in fact, can see the likeness of God. He is able to see me in a vision that nobody else is able to see. Umadua lo yereisem ledaber ba'avdi b'moshe. In which case, how come you didn't fear to speak against my leader, Moshe Rabbeinu, the great Moses? There's leaders who transcend the ordinary aspect of life. The ordinary aspects of leadership. They are so great and so fantastic and so incredible and so remarkable that challenging their leadership actually undermines the concept of leadership. Because when we look for leaders, we look for great people. And when we find great people, don't find reasons to knock them down. Don't find reasons to diminish them and to dismiss them. They are great. And they are greater than their peers, more charismatic, more accomplished they can achieve things that other people can't achieve. And that being the case, your role is not to challenge them necessarily, but to support them. That is so important. That is really what you need to be doing. Continued with the fourth source that I have here in my source sheets. And this is the piece where Moshe Rabbeinu now talks not to Korach, but to Dosan and Aviram, whose challenge to the leadership was not one of resentment because I've got something but I don't have everything I want. It was one of protesting for the sake of protesting, undermining for the sake of destruction, not for the sake of construction. When you are constructive, that's one thing. But when you are destructive, you don't just destroy the people you want to destroy, you destroy everything. The fabric of society can be undermined. That was Dosan and Aviram. Perhaps Korah had a legitimate question to ask. He didn't present it in a legitimate fashion. But perhaps he could have said, listen, if I'm from the tribe of Levites, perhaps I also have a role to play as a Kohen. By the way, Rashi, as Rashi quotes from the Medrash, Rashi says, Oile Rasha, Oile Shechenoi. If that was the case, he wouldn't have chosen Dosan and Aviram to be his counterparts in this revolution, in this rebellion. He would have come to himself privately in a meeting with Moshe Rabbeinu and said, come on, give me an, a, a chance and had a discussion with Moshe Rabbeinu, a trusted servant of God, as to what his, Korach's role should be going forward. But that's not what he did. He aligned himself with some of the vilest people in Jewish society, the lowest dregs. People whose only intent was to undermine and destroy, namely Dosan and Aviram. And I'm not making this up. Let's see what the Torah has to say in their own words about Dosan and Aviram. Vayishlach Moshe likroi le Dosan ve Aviram. Moses called to Dosan and Aviram b'nei Eliyah v'yoymru loi nale. Even though he sought an audience with them, they said, we're not going. Is it not enough that he brought us from a land flowing with milk and honey? To kill us, to murder us in the wilderness? By the way, there's no evidence whatsoever that Moses wanted them to die or that there was any threat 
to their lives. This is fiery rhetoric. This is incendiary rabble-rousing, as if Moshe Rabbeinu in some way wanted to kill Dosan and Abiram. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. And they say as follows, he, all he wants is he wants to lord it over us. He wants to be in charge. He doesn't care if we die. He has no interest in us. By the way, that's a legitimate claim against leadership, but it wasn't true about Moshe Rabbeinu. There are some leaders whose only interest is that they have the power and others don't. And they, of course, wanted to suggest that that was Moshe's guiding principle. He wanted to be in charge so that they shouldn't and that they should be underneath him. And they continued, In fact, not only did he draw us out and take us out of a, of a wonderfully wealthy country where we were living a marvelous life. What a lie, by the way. You know, they rewriting history. They lived in Egypt as slaves. It was hardly an Eretz Zovas Cholov Udvash. But in any event, they suggest that Moshe Rabbeinu had promised them that they would go to an Eretz Zovas Cholov Udvash, but he never took us there. Sorry, Atanaker Loi Nale. He says, even if you'd brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and give us, given us possession of fields and vineyards, should you gouge out those men's eyes? We will not come. This was a direct challenge to Moshe Rabbeinu's leadership. As far as Dosan and Abiram were concerned, notwithstanding any good that he had ever done, they were not interested. They couldn't care less. We don't want, by the way, the tribe of Reuven has a bit of a taina. They have a bit of a complaint. Why? Because Reuven was the firstborn. Levi had replaced Reuven as the servants of God, as the ritual leaders of the Jewish nation. And therefore, there was a lot of resentment among the Reuven tribe. And the mouthpiece for that resentment were two people, initially three, because Oin ben Peles joined, but there were two people. Oin ben Peles removed himself, probably at the, with the assistance of his wife, who wanted him to avoid any negative outcome. But Dosan and Aviram, who were rabble-rousers and troublemakers with a history, with form, for creating and fermenting problems in the Jewish nation, and they understood the zeitgeist, the resentment that existed within their ranks, within the Reuven tribe, and they capitalized on it by attacking Moshe Rabbeinu and suggesting that they wanted to grab back the leadership. Not because Moshe Rabbeinu, there was anything wrong with him, they suggested there was, but because they deserve it more than him. So you see what aligned them with Korach, was not because they were deserving, but because they were naturally rebellious and resentful and angry. And that bitterness was what underpinned and underscored everything that they did in the midst of this rebellion. So now we continue with Shmuel Base. It's a story of corrupt leadership. And corrupt leadership is very dangerous because corrupt leadership can cause enormous problems. People who deserve to be the leader, but who misuse and abuse, abuse their leadership powers are a grave danger, not just to the society which they lead, but to leadership in general. Because who wants to belong to a society that has such grave issues with leadership? Listen carefully. This is the story of the two sons of Eli HaKoyen, the high priest, the time of Shmuel Hanovi. And this is what it says. Eli's sons were scoundrels. They paid no heed to God. 
This is how the priests used to deal with the people. When anyone brought a sacrifice, the priest's boy would come along with a free, three-pronged fork while the meat was boiling, while it was cooking. And he would thrust it into the cauldron, into the pot. And whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take away. This was the practice at Shiloh with all the Israelites who came there. You can imagine that those people who were wanting to eat from the Karbonus became resentful of the fact that the Kohanim would behave in this fashion. But even before it turned into smoke, the priest's boy would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, hand over some meat to roast for the priest. In other words, they were extorting them and misusing their leadership powers to, for personal gain. And if the man said to him, no, I, I want to bring the sacrifice and then you can take whatever it is that you want. He said, no. The boy would say, give it to me right now. Or I will take it by force. The sin of the young men against God was very great. For the men who, who brought the carbonus were extremely careful to bring them properly. Elia Cohen was very old. This is what it says here. It's in Pericute base, uh, Peric base, Pasukut base to Pasuk Chavtes in Shmuel Aleph. Eli was very old. He heard that it, what his sons were doing and how they behaved inappropriately with women who were doing tasks in the Oihel Mayet. And a man of God came to Eli and he said, So said God, I revealed myself to your father's house in Egypt when they were the subject, when they were subjects of the house of Pera, Pharaoh. And I chose them from among all the tribes of Israel to be my priests, to ascend my altar, to burn incense, and to carry an aphoid before me. And I assigned to your father's house all the offerings by fire of the Israelites. In other words, you are a person of great privilege. You are in the position of leadership. You have enormous benefits because of who you are. Why then, says this man of God to Elia Cohen, do you maliciously trample upon the sacrifices and offerings that I have commanded? You have honored your sons more than me, feeding on the first portions of every offering of my people Israel. The abuse of power is one of the great threats to steady leadership and stable societies. Because people who have power become corrupted. And while it's true that we need to invest people with power, one has to also have methods by which we can challenge those people in power to ensure that they don't abuse that power and cause problems and difficulties for those people who are their subject or subjects to their power. I'm now going to change, I'm not going to quote now from Tanakh, I'm going to quote from The Federalist, number 70. The author, Alexander Hamilton. Did you see the musical, Hamilton? This is not from the musical. This is actually something that was published during the time of Hamilton's, um, Hamilton's involvement with the creation of the United States of America. From March 18th, 1788. This, the title of this piece is The Executive Department Further Considered. To the people of the state of New York, that I'm reading his words, there is an idea, which is not without it, its advocates, that a vigorous executive is inconsistent with the genius of republican government. The enlightened well-wishers to this species of government must at least hope that the supposition is destitute of foundation, since they can never admit its truth without at the same time admitting the condemnation of their own principles. Energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of good government. It is essential to the protection of the community against foreign attacks. It is not less essential to the steady administration of the laws to the protection of property against those irregular and high-handed combinations which sometimes interrupt the ordinary course of justice, and to the security of liberty against the enterprises and assaults of ambition, of faction, and of anarchy. 
It's incredibly important, Hamilton is saying, to have strong and determined leadership and not to allow leadership to be undermined and to ensure that leadership is never corrupted because the threats to leadership are great and constant. And he continues, every man, the least conversant in Roman history, knows how often that republic was obliged to take refuge in the absolute power of a single man under the formidable title of dictator, as well, uh, as well against the intrigues of ambitious individuals who aspired to the tyranny. <coughs> At the seditions of whole classes of the community whose conduct threatened the existence of all government as against the invasions of external enemies who menaced the conquest and destruction of Rome. Sometimes leadership needs to be decisive and strong for the very reason that those who undermine it are complaining about it. In other words, sometimes those who are good in power need to use their power to oppose the bad of those who claim that they want better for the people, but whose ultimate aim is anarchy. And Hamilton continues, There can be no need, however, to multiply arguments or examples on, its, on this head. A feeble executive implies a feeble execution of the government. A feeble execution is but another phrase for a bad execution. And a government ill-executed, whatever it may be in theory, must be in practice a bad government. Leadership with multiple heads, a hydra of leadership, is no leadership at all, right? I mean, we know that, we understand it. Because unless you have decisive and determined leadership, which has ideals, ideology, and which is strong in terms of execute, uh, executing the power which is given to them, it is not leadership at all. It's just a representation of ideas, but it means nothing. Continues Hamilton. That unity is conducive to energy will not be disputed. Decision, activity, secrecy and dispatch will generally characterize the proceedings of one man in a much more eminent degree than the proceedings of any greater number. And in proportion as the number is increased, these qualities will be diminished. Wherever two or more persons are engaged in any common enterprise or pursuit, there is always danger of difference of opinion. If it be a public trust or office in which they are clothed with equal dignity and authority, there is peculiar danger of personal emulation and even animosity. From either and especially from all these causes, the most bitter dissensions are apt to spring. Whenever these happen, they lessen the respectability, weaken the authority and distract the plans and operation of those whom they divide. If they should unfortunately assail the supreme executive magistracy of a country consisting of a plurality of, of persons, they might impede or frustrate the most important measures of the government in the most critical emergencies of the state. Division and divisiveness, in other words, says Hamilton, are incredibly disempowering. They create a power vacuum. There's no such thing as democracy in leadership. There may be democracy, but there's no such thing as democracy in leadership. And he continues, and what is still worse, they might split the community into the most violent and irreconcilable factions, adhering differently to the different individuals who compose the magistracy. Division is destructive, in other words. That's what Hamilton is saying. By not giving people the leadership, you are undermining your own ability 
to function in society. We need, we crave, we demand leadership. Men often oppose a thing, this is Hamilton again, merely because they've had no agency in planning it, or because it may have been planned by those whom they dislike. But if they have been consulted and have happened to disapprove, opposition then becomes, in their estimation, an indispensable duty of love, of self-love. They seem to think themselves bound in honour and by all the motives of personal infallibility to defeat the success of what has been resolved upon, contrary to their sentiments. Men of upright, benevolent tempers have too many opportunities of remarking, with horror, to what desperate lengths this disposition is sometimes carried, and how often the great interests of society, you listen to this carefully, how often the great interests of society are sacrificed to the vanity, to the conceit, and to the obstinacy of individuals who have credit enough to make their passions and their caprices interesting to mankind. In other words, you can protest and be right and still be wrong because of the damage you have caused to society at large by challenging the leadership. An incredible idea. Perhaps the question now before the public may, in its consequences, afford melancholy proofs of the effects of this despicable frailty, or rather detestable vice, in the human character. I think that there is great tension in the concept of leadership. We have to choose leaders. Those leaders have to be much better than even the sum of their own parts. They have to be, in a sense, greater than who they are. They have to aspire to perfection. They can't be like Eli Hakoyen's sons who abuse their power. But at the same time, when you challenge leadership, when you undermine leadership, when you challenge the, the people in power who run our society, you run the danger of undermining the very fabric of our existence and endangering your own lives and the future of the, of the lives of your families because of what you are doing. Korach may in a sense have been right when he said Rav Lochem because everybody was a Kodosh. Yes, it's true. But by challenging Moshe Rabbeinu and by aligning yourself with ne'er-do-wells, people like Dosan and Aviram, whose only intention was to express their resentment and to undermine leadership, you're not just, it's not just a revolution against leadership in order to provide better leadership. It's revolution for the sake of revolution. And there's no such thing as revolution for the sake of revolution that ever amounts to positive results. Ultimately, it will fail because it's vanity. Ultimately, it will fail because its strategy is anarchy. Ultimately, it will fail because it doesn't really, truly have the best interests of society at large at heart. And therefore, the balance which one has to strike, has always to be respect and revere leadership, ensure that if you have complaints against leadership that it's expressed in such a way that does not undermine leadership and doesn't undermine the functioning of society, and to avoid any association with Dossons and Avirams, to avoid any association with those even if you are correct, who would do anything to foment rebellion and anarchy within the society from which we benefit and from which we take so much. We'll leave it here for today. Thank you.